Thank you so much. So uh, can everybody hear me OK? So wonderful to be with you. I feel like I, I deserve credits for this class. I've been down here so frequently this semester that uh, I think I get uh, three extra credits. So I'm not sure where the provost is, but that goes towards my next degree. Uh, I also just really am grateful to be here primarily because a number of my just dearest friends and trust network are here and just really appreciate your support. I'm particularly delighted today to have my sweetheart uh, Gay with me and my, my youngest son Alexander Hans. And so just really, uh, really delight to have them with me today. As I was preparing this presentation, um, I had a lot of fun with it because I have not done this one before and it was actually a direct down the throat fit of kind of where I'm at in my life right now. And that is, is analyzing the impact of life. I've been deeply reading on this topic lately and a couple of books that just I can't get enough of. David Brooks, The Second Mountain, uh, the writings by Parker Palmer, and uh, even a little bit of Jordan Peterson's works have just really fascinated with me. So uh, today I wanted to try and make this a little bit fun and hopefully not too irreverent and too low-minded, but also uh, maybe down the throat a little bit of the moral conundrums that we face in life in general. So I'm going to ask Alex to jump up with me quickly, and we're going to do a real, we got to do this really, really quickly so don't, we don't waste a, a bunch of time. But I'd like you to just quickly look down this list. And, oh, wrong button. Let's try that one right there that list right there, and I'd like you to just quickly raise your hand when you think this is the most likely to have moral conundrums, okay? Does that make sense? And then we're going to do the same thing of the least likely to have uh, moral conundrums. So is Mother Teresa more likely to have a moral conundrum than a lawyer, an engineer, or a medical doctor? So let's go down the list and just raise your hands, and Alex, you don't have to do an exact, but get kind of a quick little count. Okay, all who think that corporate exec executives have the most moral conundrums in life, raise your hand. Okay, now professional athletes. None? Okay, we got one. <laughs> Lawyers. I better see a bunch of hands here. <laughs> All right, we have a lawyer grinning in the back of the room. <laughs> Engineer. One, okay, two, two, awesome, very interesting. Uh, medical doctor. Okay. And students. All right, <laughs> two votes. I guess when you're a when you're a professor of uh, finance, you get two votes. That's how we do the math in this class. <laughs> awesome, professors. Okay, we got one. Good, good. I'm glad we got one. And how about Mother Teresa? Okay, we got one, really, one. Okay, we got one, Mother Teresa. Now we'll just do the same thing really quickly. On the other hand, who has the least moral conundrums? Corporate executives? Professional athletes? Lawyers? No hands. Oh, one hand. <laughs> okay, awesome. There's, there we just, our, our IQ in the room just collectively went up by about a thousand points right there as he walked in. Uh, let's go medical doctors. Least moral conundrums. And now students. Really? Okay, we're going to have a conversation about that. Uh, professors. And Mother Teresa. Okay, quite a few. We didn't get all the votes. Okay, thanks, Alex. So it's pretty clear that we think the one that have the most conundrums is attorneys, and then the least is professional athletes. All right, I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of little uh, slides here. We get the warhead, and we hold the world ransom for one million dollars. <laughs> Think we should maybe ask for more than a million dollars. A million dollars is exactly a lot of money these days. It's not unknown, indeed, corporate executives have a lot of dilemmas, particularly when it comes uh, to the way that we're seeing the markets run right now. 
All right, so uh, indeed corporate oh, executives have a lot of dilemmas, and I'm going to talk a, about that a little bit later today. I mean, with every transaction, it has impact to have moral dilemmas, and there's dramatic differences between being legal and being moral. And we see a lot of the repercussions and backlashes in society uh, regarding this right now. So I'm going to skip over that one quickly, but indeed, me being one of them as an entrepreneur and corporate executives, we have held the hostage, the world hostage, for one million dollars. <laughs> All right, I'd ask the question, how many professional athletes are actually imposing and helping our moral high ground? How many of the athletes are actually doing it for money, just transactional versus role models? I'd actually argue and contend that a lot of our professional athletes are actually very much in conflict with moral objectives and dilemmas. And I think as we see our youth looking at them as role models and many of the negative behaviors and patterns going on, indeed our professional athletes have incredible moral conundrums to, that take place. Uh, I, yeah, okay, so I got to tell my lawyer joke. Uh, three surgeons are uh, in a room de debating of who is the easiest to operate on. And the first surgeon says, oh, I love the accountants. I just love the accountants. You open them up, you put the ones to the ones, the twos to the twos, the threes to the threes, fours to the fours, they put up, oh, everything's really easy, everything's organized. It's like, oh, no, no, it's the marketing and the business guys. You open them up, blues go to blue, red go to red, yellow to yellow, you put them back together and everything's perfect. And the third says, oh, you guys got it all wrong, it's the attorneys. There's no brains, no guts, and the head and tail are interchangeable. <laughs> 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 uh, lawyers get a lot of bad raps. They get a lot of bad raps. And, and indeed, I avoid attorneys uh, for the most part every chance I, I get, but the reality is uh, they're also necessary. And uh, I've countless times in my career seen situations where attorneys will escalate the two clients, agitating them, to increase the fees and the basis and nobody ends up winning. So I think uh, attorneys are indeed well documented and that, that proved out here. How about engineers? All right, you gotta have Napoleon Dynamite's great engineering nerd skills, right? No ethical dilemmas for engineers. How many did we have? We had a couple. Uh, one, two, three. We had three. Uh, I'm an engineer. And indeed, I've had as many ethical dilemmas as an engineer that I had as a businessman. I was uh, making a trip here about a month ago, and uh, the guy that I had called to, to pick me up on Uber, I was fascinated with him. This is like one of the most articulate guy. I, I knew I was in trouble when he was playing opera when, uh, <laughs> when I got in the car. And so I, I began asking about him. We had an incredibly deep conversation, and it turned out he was uh, about my age. And he said, I had to quit my career because uh, I was, uh, my soul was lost. I was in major jeopardy. And I said, uh, wh what did you do? And he says, oh, I'm an engineer. He says, really? Tell me more about that. So we had this very interesting conversation that he had uh, been an electrical engineer and then he'd went to work for Raytheon. And he'd become actually a director at Raytheon. And um, he says, I could do it as long as I really, really believed in all of our methods. And it was, I'm, he says, quote, I'm a true patriot. But I started having problems when all the measurement systems started being C per, CPC. Marketing guys, I said, oh, cost per click or market? What are you talking about? This is not market, no, no, he says cost per casualty. So we had to do all of our engineering and everything that we did based on how much did it cost to kill somebody or injure somebody. And so every single drone, every single technology that they were building 
was based on cost per casualty. Moral dilemma? He actually had to quit his job, very, very lucrative job, and became an Uber driver because he felt so conflicted about cost per casualty without him fully morally buying into it. Maybe we should have increased engineers just a little bit there. All right, medical doctors. Stinson, Marston, and Gill of the Northampton Trauma Institute, and Dr. Emma House of the Zurich Relief Fund. These are our newly arrived surgeons, Drs. Trowbridge and Greenbaum. Doctor? 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 And doctor. Well, we miss anyone? <laughs> <laughs> All right, doctor, doctor. We not only got a lot of vibrato going on, but I'd say we have some pretty big, moral, sticky wickets. Uh, my younger brother's a doctor at the emergency room. I actually am more concerned. I have another brother that's an attorney. I actually oh, see moral, moral dilemmas that they have than me as a businessman. Uh, someone comes into the emergency room. Maybe one of you guys, and you don't have an insurance. Serious, serious issue going on. And uh, thinks 95%, 98% probability know exactly what it is can treat it. But for legal protection, and also, by the way, to increase the cost of efficiency to make more money, a whole bank of tests are ran, and you walk out of the, the, the emergency room with a $15,000 bill that you can't pay that puts you into financial du duress. Is that a moral dilemma, an ethical dilemma? Uh, what about our challenges and problems with big pharma that are going on? Where did a lot of that uh, come from? The opiate epidemic that's taking place. Tragically, a lot of that uh, came out of doctors. So does it, would everyone nod a little bit and agree that maybe there's some sticky wickets even with doctors? We had how many we had? Oh, we had good ones, okay. So everyone saw that there's some sticky wickets in addition to the vibrato. All right, we've got you students now. We only have two students, the lowest second. No, we had professors was the lowest. We're going to ch change your mind on that. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? <laughs> I've got it right here in front of me. He has missed nine days. <laughs> All right, without raise of hands and out without incriminating you. How many of you have been Ferris Bueller? How many of you have come to this class or another class and had a friend or someone check you in or sign you in? I'd actually argue that this is a great pro proving ground and every day you're, you're faced with uh, moral ethical dilemmas. How many of you used uh, crib sheets or, or your, your friend's notes and actually not really learned the material? I'd, I'd argue that you actually have equal number of moral ethical dilemmas as, uh, as an attorney. All right, certainly the professors have no moral ethical dilemmas, right? No, no, no dilemmas there. Yes, we've all got both flight and die inside us. What matters is the power we choose to act on. All right, so the professors, hmm. Uh, indeed, professors can do an amazing amount of good, but I'd actually argue that some of the greatest tragedies uh, in the world have occurred at the hands of professors. They show up on a bad day trying to figure something out and vomit their garbage on you and indoctrinate and affect generations and generations. Nihilism, where did that come from? Uh, what about uh, the, the Berkeley uh, breakdowns or, or, or the Woodstock incidents? Even here at SUU, we have challenges and dilemmas. Uh, a classroom can be uh, registered by the professor 
and let's say that it uh, holds 25, 30 students, and we love small classroom sizes, right? We love them. Doesn't everybody love the small classroom sizes? But what if the professor is deliberately and purposely booking a class that is just a little bit too small, knowing that then they'll get to book an overage and get to, to, to teach another class to, for monetary reasons? Ethical dilemmas? I'd say that professors arguably have the most influence and maybe the most ethical dilemmas of anyone, anyone in the room, uh, the, even more than anyone because they get a lot of influence on the thought leadership going forward. I know as a, as a thought leader, I have to take very seriously when I express an opinion too publicly because it can actually sand you or other people's in the weeds. So I would actually argue if I was to have voted, I think that professors may have been my number one ethical dilemma vote. All right. And we'll finish with Mother Teresa. I'm surprised anyone voted for Mother Teresa. I'm glad to see that there was one. 30 years of Mother Teresa's life, 30 years, right in the middle of all of her impact, this was the statement she was making. I have no faith. I'm told God loves me. Nothing touches my soul. An empty place in my heart. There is no faith. I have terrible pain of loss of God not wanting me. God not wanting, not being God, or God not really existing. That's Mother Teresa in the middle of her ministry. Now, uh, fortunately, on the front end and then also on the back end, Mother Teresa indeed did have it figured out. But I would say that it's probably some pretty sticky moral ethical dilemmas. And in her private journals, she talks about the dis how disingenuous she felt carrying on with her work and her, her relationship with God in this dilemma. So I guess the point that I'm trying to make is, is we all face really significant moral dilemmas, and it's part of the greatness of life. Fried like a funnel cake. That's how I have felt most of my career. Much to my chagrin and, and uh, very vulnerably, this next part, uh, Tyler had asked me to really speak honestly and openly. He is aware of some of my background, and so uh, I'm going to, I call it opening the kimono a little bit and speak very transparently and, and real about maybe my career and my background a little bit. I'm incredibly blessed. I've had the most amazing career. I wouldn't trade places with anyone in the world. And, and I'm so grateful for the life I've had, but much of it has felt like I'm going down a roller coaster backwards. And every plan I had wasn't the plans that I had. And the reality is, is I've had a, a couple of really significant moral dilemmas to the point that I'll make this statement that I'm not sure phew, very vulnerably that I can be reclaimed. Um, I grew up in Beaver, Utah. All 2,000 of us count the cows. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that I grew up in Beaver. Uh, I never quite fit in all the way. I was just some weird little nerdy guy that always had to be creating and selling stuff. Even my dad and my, everyone thought I was just a little bit nuts. I just couldn't help myself from wanting to create stuff. And so uh, I, I ended up going to Brigham Young University and I chose to be an electrical engineer primarily because I didn't understand it. My, my whole reason I chose that major is it's something I just didn't understand, and I took a D on one test on electricity. So I entered a very rigorous engineering program, got partway into it, and set the goal that I wanted to work for Boeing. About that time, I fell in love with my wife, who happened to be going to Southern Utah University. And I'll state that the best part of my entire collegiate career was coming down here to Southern Utah University. And so I came down to chase my wife and with some incredible hard work and great fortune and a lot of, lot of, lot of effort, I was able to capture and convince my wife to marry me. Uh, while I was down here at Southern Utah University, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later, but I was able to hear from Dr. Wolf, who'd lived a, a World War II veteran, and he had cancer and I saw how vigilantly he worked. He had a couple of things. He was just mesmerized as he would talk about Plato and Aristotle and philosophy. And I just became captivated, opened my brain to a lot more diverse thinking than just being an engineer. We ended up going back to uh, 
Provo to finish my electrical engineering degree and it became very evident I hated being an engineer and I wasn't a very good engineer to be honest with you. And so uh, my goal still was to work for Boeing. Uh, through a set of very fortunate uh, situations I had a couple of really good breaks and I think it's actually uh, several of you have heard it but I'm going to very uh, transparently to tell what those breaks uh, were and then what, how that influenced my life. So I, my wife and I got married. We had $500 to our name, and I brought a, a Dodge Colt that had been totaled three times, <laughs> had a cracked head and leaked oil, and you can only drive it across town. And uh, our weekly food budget was $12, and we were just barely making it. I mean, just barely, barely, barely making it. And I had a job. I, I got a really potentially good job at a company called Net, uh, Netline. And we were doing really interesting technology work, and it was very early stage. And there was this guy in there that I was just so impressed. I saw him, and it's like, wow, when I grow up, I want to be like him. He wasn't even necessarily, I think, the president. He was just one of the leaders in the company. But he was articulate, and he was fun, he was approachable. And I actually kind of started watching and modeling him a little bit. And then this day uh, came when we were supposed to get some funding. And as I was leaving uh, the building, I, I wasn't the smartest, but I was always the hardest working. I was the first one there and the last to leave. And so I saw that this demo area that they were doing was really messy. The screens were terrible. They were dirty. And uh, cords were all over the place. So Gay came to pick me up. And we went down. And she vacuumed. And I cleaned things up and spotted it up a little bit. And the next day, this guy named Rain Orta came in. And they g gave him a couple of million dollars. And, and Th this leader figured out that I was the one that did that and he ended up promoting me to be the guy that would come around with him to set up technology. He, su he s learned that I could actually articulate the technology pretty good and he had me start doing some of the presentations. The company ended up going bankrupt, a complete total failure. But that relationship evolved into my first major mentor in life that I was able to model after. Th that individual was Alan Hall. Alan Hall is an amazing individual to this day. He's still one of my primary mentors. So that gave me the faith, the confidence to then go forward, and I, I decided I wasn't going to live small. And so all out started really aggressively getting after it, and through a couple of really for, fortunate circumstances, and quite frankly, some dumb luck, partially, part of my wife believing in me, and, and part of it just working really hard, I was able to run a couple of large companies here in the <laughs> United States. Um, the first being Mitsubishi Electric, their PC division here. I was their general manager for a number of years and went to do my own business and failed it. As a matter of fact, uh, I was gone for a period of time and my business partner lost basically everything that we had. And so I had to go back and get another job and I landed at a prime media company called About.com. I probably shouldn't have said that because I'm going to get very vulnerable here a little bit. Not, not too much maybe for the camera. but. <laughs> And uh, as I was in that company, uh, we were very successful. We were the fifth largest web traffic company that there was. And uh, being very successful, but I was really, really struggling with a number of the things that were, I was being directed to do. Were they legal? Absolutely. Were they moral? Mm. Were they ethical? Definitely not. Uh, things such as Capitalization, how we would, uh, when engineers would do work, putting it toward uh, c uh, capital expenditure rather than, than work, uh, which would I inflate basically the, the, the valuation of the company. Uh, things such as hiring lots of small groups of engineers and then paying them a premium. Oh, we'll pay you even more. You're not charging enough. But then putting the payment terms on net 120 which means that we didn't have to pay them for 120 days knowing they'd get there and then they'd delay the payables until the engineering team would go out of business. And then you could not have to pay them for all of that work that was done. And it really, really troubled me. I'll never forget a conversation that I, I had with my sweetheart. One day I came home and says, honey, this is just killing me. I just hate it. She stopped me, grabbed my arm, shook me and says, when are you just going to quit and do your own thing? When are you going to have the courage to be an entrepreneur? And so uh, based on that, uh, I did at that point. I, I left a very, very high paying job. I had a, uh, an office that overlooked the ball in Times Square. It was really cool. It was really stable. But that's what prompted me to eventually become an entrepreneur. Um, and yeah, I won't, I won't tell that story. 
So I, I left the corporate world, jumped right immediately in uh, to be an entrepreneur. Three weeks into it, I'd saved up enough money. We'd paid our home off, and I'd saved up enough money to last a year. Three weeks into the experience, I blew my Achilles tendon out. Snap it goes. I thought a kid had hit me from behind, but I'm laying there on the floor. My leg doesn't work. I don't know what you know about Achilles tendons, but it's not a good injury. So being the hardworking, disciplined I was, it's like, okay, well, that'll only take a couple of months to heal and I'll work real hard. So two months into it, I wasn't supposed to exercise it till three months. Two months in, I'm working it because I've got to get back and going. Snap goes the Achilles tendon again. Snap it goes. And now I'm down six months, can't get out of bed for six months. I didn't know pain like that even existed in the world, guys. And so I'm laying there thinking, man, what am I going to do? As a matter of fact, I told the surgeon when he did it, okay, I'll, I'll work through it this time, but if it's the third time, you better get it right, because if it happens the third time, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Keep the guns away from me. Oh, I can't believe I said that, but it was, it was that bad. And so my wife and my son drilled a hole up through the bottom of the floor. Connect, it's before Wi-Fi connected to the computer and um, in between uh, pain medication and purple elephants floating around the room, which is truth, I, I ended up finding this very interesting little Google thing, this anomaly with Google. And uh, what I discovered, they just come out with AdSense and I discovered that, wait, wait, I can buy the word cars for like 25 cents, but then I can take around and build websites on like BMW's Mercedes for and send it out for a dollar. So buy it from Google for 25 cents, send it out for 15 cents, send it out for a dollar. So in the middle of this uh, very psychedelic phase of my life, I actually created my first entrepreneurial win. And uh, it was basically arbitrage. Was that moral? I don't know. I was just taking advantage of a, marketing, a market efficiency. It, it, was it moral or ethical? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Nonetheless, it, it was a huge blessing in our life and it, it drove me forward. And, I, and I'll say boldly, there hasn't been one business that I've done that I haven't had to look at and say, is this moral, is this ethical? Is this something that's on bounds or not in bounds? And so uh, I've, really, I've really seriously thought and contemplated uh, what and why we do things. I do want to tell one other quick little story. One of the companies that I was involved in recently uh, maybe I'll ask you the judgment uh, on it, is we had contracts with vendors and suppliers, and uh, very uh, specifically, it, it would say where we would not be able to sell the products and services. That being said, the people selling the products and services in the market uh, weren't doing it, and even the companies that we were buying from knew most of the time that we were doing it. So I, in essence, was taking products and buying it and then selling it into channels that weren't always approved. Everybody won. The, the company even most of the time knew, and they won. The, uh, we won, the distributors won, the end customer won, but it was out of sync with a contract on technicality. So a, a moral ethical dilemma. What would you do? Would you take it and take advantage of that or not take advantage of that? I think there's opportunities in every aspect of life to have these moral conundrums. I'm still facing them. Uh, as, as I write the next series of books that, that I'm looking at, at doing, the moral conundrums of, of disclosure becomes a real issue. So the conclusion that I've come to is, is it doesn't matter what you do, we have to face this very interesting dilemma in our lives. How do you live an undivided life? I am your wife and I am the greatest good you're ever going to know. <laughs> uh, all through life you're going to face that 
that conundrum of the greater good solving the earth. Where's my super suit? I got to put on my super suit. And the greatest good you'll ever know is your wife. <laughs> And the reality is, is it's tricky and it's complicated, and I don't think there is any one way down the path. I used to think when I first started my career that balance was walking a very delicate line of getting up at 3 or 5, 6.30 in the morning and reading and exercising and studying and this and then lunch and then this and get home and hello and living this very balanced life. I've come to the conclusion that that's not reality, and for me, that does not work. I've come to the conclusion that living life extremely out of balance is how I actually find balance. Incredibly pushing hard at Southern Utah University for a week. And then hardcore pushing a work agenda, hardcore writing. And balance actually is not necessarily walking right down the middle, but actually crossing the lines of balance as frequently as possible. The difficulty for me and my perspective is, is when I just get one focus, one way, one path, one direction and never let it go. And I was in danger in that early in my career. Growing up in Beaver, I desperately, I so bad wanted the brass ring. I'd do anything to win that brass ring to the point that when I was running Mitsubishi Electric, I'd sleep underneath my desk probably three nights of the week. I took incredible pride incredible pride in when they'd send executives over from Japan or United Kingdom. I'd actually get them on an airplane and I would fly them deliberately back and forth from East Coast to West Coast, making them sleep on the plane for red eyes and work them to the point where they actually went into frenzied exhaustion. But it, d it developed a reputation that I was a really hard worker, but it was actually really, really pretty stupid to do. I'd been through a period of doing this for about a year and a half, and I got a call from Dr. Peter Horn, who was another one of my major mentors, and he was actually uh, running this division of Mitsubishi Electric. He was my direct report. His uh, secretary called up and says, Peter would like to have a chat. What that meant was is I would jump on a plane in Salt Lake, go to Atlanta, Atlanta, Amsterdam, Amsterdam across the channel into Birmingham, United Kingdom. 22 and a half hours later, I show up in Dr. Horn's office, and he sat me down, and this is the conversation that we had. Rich, we're delighted with the progress that you've made in the United States, in, in the market. But uh, that's not why I called you here today. I called you here for a personal matter. Uh, I want to make a statement to you that you can replace anything in this life. You can replace anything in this life, jobs, money, cars, but you can't replace these three things. Number one, you can't replace your health. Number two, you can't replace your trust relationships, and most importantly, you cannot replace your family. Go home. If you're in work, in the next two weeks, you're fired. <laughs> it was a very long 22 and a half hour flight home. I uh, thought and considered uh, what had taken place that last year, year and a half, and I'd been in India, one of the, uh, we were one of the first groups in India to, when we were starting to outsource technology. And although I'd been immunized, I brought back with me what was called pertussis, whooping cough. And uh, my family, my boys had been immunized. I came back and shared that delightful thing with my, my family. My wife didn't get it, but uh, my, my three oldest did get it. At that point, my son Nathan was about four months old. We'd get up in the middle of the night and you'd basically cough until you'd vomit in the shower and then go. So in the middle of that state, I should have been even down, but what was I doing? I was being Mr. Wonderful. I was like razzle dazzling. I was still going. I was still out earning that stupid brass ring, <laughs> showing that I could do it. And Dr. Horn saw that and in all truthfulness. The primary reason I got the job in the first place was my wife, because he fell in love with my wife. And he sees me out there chasing the brass ring. So I'm thinking about all these stupid things I'd been doing that year. I get home and I rush to the crib of my son Nathan's bed. He was about six months old at that point. And I, go, I pick him up. I was like, I'm going to do better. I'm going to do better. I pick him up. He wakes up. He looks at me and starts screaming, screaming, pushes me away. And at that point, I realized that my son didn't even know who I was. Although it did take me a couple of three years after that to actually get out of the corporate world. That was the moment that I formally decided I was going to be an entrepreneur and, and leave the corporate world. 
uh, and I chose deliberately, right nor wrong, I chose, and I know we heard a couple of weeks ago from, we've heard from several of my dear friends, and uh, one of them didn't leave, and his wife, and it worked out really good, but I chose to leave the corporate world. I chose to live a more moderate, balanced life and pursue the life of an entrepreneur. Now, that doesn't mean that I have less work, but I get to control the agenda and the frames and the setups, and it brought me to this conclusion, the middle way. Uh, I love the concept of moderation between extremes of sensual indulgence and self-mortification. I think that the, the solution that I offer you with the moral conundrums and sticky wickets in your life is, is, is to live in the middle way, the balanced way, the more approach. Yes, with the crossing of the zigzags, but also the middle way. Anytime I see extreme points of view, my alarm bells go off. Extreme, extreme, sleeping under a desk is dangerous. Also, just being apathetic, pathetic, and hey, dude, whatever, I'm just working for the man and faking it. That's also dangerous. I think that there's a middle way in life we must follow. So I think that uh, if I was to give you a, a couple of major conclusions and takeaways, uh, as I've deeply thought on that, this is what it would be. It's more than do no harm. We often hear that, even from doctors, it's do no harm. It's bigger than that, it's do good. Speak with integrity to yourself and others or say nothing at all. And our primary purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. The Dalai Lama. The second is, is learn from your mistakes of the past. Don't throw away the conventional wisdom of the past. We have tens of thousands of years of learning. I love this statement, and I always misquote it a little bit, so I had to put it up exactly as it was said. This is uh, Mark Twain. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to be around the old man. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he learned in those seven years. <laughs> It's really troubled me a, a little bit of this meme going back and forth. I laugh at it, and my wife and even joke, and go, we, we keep saying uh, to Alex, uh, go Boomer. Did I get that right? <laughs> okay, Boomer. Okay, Boomer. <laughs> See, I can't even get that right. Oh. <laughs> okay, Boomer. But I think that there's danger in that language and that rhetoric. And I also think there's danger in us thinking like we know everything. My half, half of the problems that you kids have, we're the ones that caused them. If anyone's going to gripe about the millennials, we need to gripe to ourselves because we put the sticky wicket to cause that. So I think don't throw away the conventional wisdom of the past, what's been learned. Those who cannot remember from the past are condemned to repeat it. Okay, here's a quote that I just love. <laughs> hmm, eerily familiar. If you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. We've got to learn from the mistakes of the past or we're going to end up repeating them. The third is, is I've really loved this one, and, and I think uh, particularly, I, I, I kicked on this a lot this morning in the lecture that I gave, but I think it's really important as students that you get broad perspective. I'd mentioned Dr. Wolf, and even though I was an engineer with a business focus, some of the greatest learnings I had were in philosophy or even art history. So I love this quote. Uh, from J.F. Roxburgh, when the headmaster of Stowe School in Vermont was asked in the 1920s about the purpose of his institution, he said, he said is to turn out young men who are acceptable at a dance, but invaluable in a shipwreck. As the chairman of the, uh, the trustees here at Southern Utah University, I'd actually make that statement. I don't know a shipwreck, because we don't have tons of shipwrecks now. But I'd actually say one of the greatest things we could do for you as students is, is make you acceptable at a dance, but actually invaluable in a crisis or a shipwreck. The fourth and the, the final comment that I would make is, is this. Show up as the best authentic version of yourself. I'd stated it earlier, and that's a Parker uh, Palmer quote, to say the truth, speak the truth or say nothing at all. But our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to who someone, this image of someone, okay, let me start that over. Our deepest calling is to grow into our own authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to some image of who we others think we ought to be. As we do so, we'll not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we'll also find our path of authentic service in the world. 
I challenge you, each one of you, to be the best version of the authentic self that you can be. And if that's a nerd with mad nerd engineering skills, be the best nerd you can be. If it's a salesperson, be the best ascendant version of yourself that you can be. Be quirky. Pull off your craziness. Don't be afraid to, to speak and just be you. When you stack yourself under all these crazy layers of pretense, you're actually just covering up your, your, your purpose in this world. So be quirky, be eccentric, be yourself, and don't be afraid to even be just a little bit crazy. The last statement that I wanted to make is, is please live big. I'm a huge advocate and fan for, for the, the millennials. We uh, hear so much doom and gloom and down trotted speak these days. Uh, the reality is, is a lot of it is just crazy bunk. Man, if I was in you guys' situation, geez, it wouldn't have been 51 business. It would have been 151, and there would have been a heck of a lot more. Never have we lived in a time of more abundance. And a lot of the scarcity that we're hearing is nothing more than nonsense. Never in the history of the world has there been less disease, with the exception of the AIDS epidemic in subcontinental Africa. Never has there been per capita less war. Never in the time has there been uh, more opportunity financial independence. The, the perceptions of poverty have went down dramatically, and we hear how hard it is. Actually, the, the standard of living in the world has increased dramatically. And I'll make this bold statement of some of the things that my generation messed up, quite frankly, including the environment, and I think even some of this mean-spirited nature of divisiveness that's taking place. You guys are the ones that have the best opportunity to unstick that. And I would challenge you, though, is also don't then mess your kids up and pass your insanities on, along the way. So uh, I just offer you hope and, and confidence that as you go forward, you'll make a difference and you can live, live big, you can live abundantly, you can create your companies, you can make a really big impact. But it will take discipline, it'll take hard work, and it will take the middle way of not being afraid to be a knowledge seeker rather than just expect it to happen. So I expressed my, oh, and to make sure I was in moral ethical dilemma, my son made sure that I had all of my credits of the video. So <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Alex, for keeping me in bounds there. And I just wish you guys an amazing adventure and path as you face your sticky wickets, because the reality is that's where we get our growth from, guys. It gets, we get our growth and our insights from having these sticky wickets and having to make the, the judgment. So thanks so much for letting me be with you and look forward to seeing you soon. Sure. Well, what time do we end at? Uh, at 20 after. Okay. So we got two questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair Black. Thank you. I needed that. Whew. I've talked a lot of business, but I haven't opened the kimono that broadly ever. <laughs> All right, is there any questions or did I get y'all put to sleep? <laughs> yes? Uh, if you could just name one of, your, uh, one of your favorite businesses or the best, like, the best time you had starting a business. Oh. So many of them, I mean. I, I oh, the, they're just, yeah, I could probably name the least favorites, but I don't know the most favorites. <laughs> they're like children. But uh, what they did, as a matter of fact, a business part that was involved in a, in a, tr a trading company was really fun. I loved the, the Google AdWords when we understood the algorithm. I built, a, uh, I built a company that we were the number, the third largest SEO agency here in the country. And man, we had that algorithm nailed. As a matter of fact, uh, we, we, we did a bunch of sites and we could just dominate, get to the top of research research. And then Google went and killed us and they changed the algorithm, the Pended Penguin updates. And so those were really fun. All right, I think no questions, Tyler. Okay. Um, I want to uh, present you with uh, the Cedar Award in recognition for all that you've done for the Thank entrepreneurship you very much. program. Uh, most of the speakers that we've had this semester uh, have been contacts of Rich that, that he's leaned on and asked to come down here. Um, and he has enormous credibility with, with entrepreneurs, in part because of, <coughs> of his success, but more than that because he is honest um, and he's moral. And, and so he has people's attention and for that we are very grateful and we're grateful for your leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you.